Today we're about to study Mark again, Mark 11 through 13. But before we go there, I, I want to read you a sentence. And the sentence is from Mark 10. And it's, it's significant because it's a, it's a bridge to what's coming up. It's on the screen right now. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. They were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. I don't know why that jumped out at me, because Mark himself doesn't tell us why they were amazed. He, he doesn't tell us why some might have been afraid. Uh, I think he leaves that for us to figure out, given everything that went before, and given everything that's going to come afterward. Uh, it's kind of a bridge. It's kind of a uh, connection. And you'll see in the outline here that Mark divides his whole book into parts. Okay, the first part was about his Jesus' baptism and call to ministry. The second part is all about the content of his mission, his ministry, his vision, uh, the dream of God, the kingdom of God, if you prefer. And he preferred that. Uh, and then the final section is all in Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem, seven chapters out of his whole 16 are devoted to his last week in Jerusalem. So you know right away what's the most important thing for him. And uh, just to go back a little bit, in chapter 10, Jesus tells his disciples over three times that the Son of Man is going to be arrested, crucified or killed, buried, and rise from the dead. Three times. And yet, according to Mark, they still don't really get it. And uh, I, I don't get it either. Because I don't think Jesus really knew what it was going to happen to him in Jerusalem exactly. He knew he was taking his life in his hands, going into Jerusalem. And, uh, but what exactly was going to happen about crucifixion and resurrection? I, I, I don't think God had whispered some kind of plan into his ear, and so he was playing it out. No. But he did know this. It was going to be dangerous. And so we start out on the path again. Now, maybe you remember that all the way back in chapter 1, Mark keeps talking about the path. Uh, he, he talks about the way of the Lord. That's the same thing as the path. Uh, your way, his ways. The Greek word for the way is the same for all of those synonyms that I just told you about. That's Mark's m metaphor for the whole of his gospel, the path. Um, the path, of course, suggests not only a way to be followed, but uh, a person to be followed. Let me say that again. The word path, used over and over again by Mark, and here in chapter 10, uh, as they were going up to Jerusalem from Jericho, it suggests a path as well as a follower, as following. And not primarily a set of beliefs. You and I, we grew up being taught that if you only believe, that if you have enough faith, 
if you know the uh, Luther's definitions in the small catechism of the Ten Commandments and so forth, then you're going to be saved. Huh? Mark doesn't know anything about that. He doesn't know anything about uh, Nicaea or Luther or today or the way we interpret what it means to be saved, what it means to go on this path. But it, this is an active kind of ministry. Jesus doesn't say, if you'd only believe. Yeah. He's talking about a way, a path. Now, an interesting thing is, evidently the first Christians were called people of the way. I like that. I really like it because it tells us right away how the first Christians in Jerusalem under James, the brother of Jesus, how they interpreted his ongoing ministry through them. The way. People of the way. I'll, I'll read you from Acts. But this I admit to you, Paul is speaking, that according to the way, which they call the sect, I worship the God of our ancestors, believing everything laid down according to the law and written in the prophets. That's Paul defending himself. But you see, his reference is to people of the way. And then another time, uh, uh, in Acts 9-2, meanwhile Saul, this is all the way back before Saul was Paul, Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? Here's Paul, you know, right before his... Uh, his uh, his vision and his, his commitment, talking about, you know, I want to arrest all those who are members of the way. Uh, some of you have been exposed to pathways over and over again. I mean, over the last few years, as one of our, as a group that preceded this, and uh, I, you've probably seen some slides that I've put up before, but I really like this next slide. And I read you a poem that I wrote some years ago and is in my little booklet of poems. It's called Tenebrae, or Tenebrae. Now, you know that is one of the Holy Week services, but do you know what it means? Well, one meaning, and we're not absolutely sure, but one meaning is shadows. Shadows. I like that. Between light and darkness. And I was talking about trying to follow the path. I must get used to this place. Between darkness and light, where mists obscure old definitions of good and evil, God and Satan. In this shadow land, old dreams change size and shape. I cannot find the path, but cross over and back again, wondering if light will ever come, or if day is like night in this place called Tenebrae. I think that's representative of most of us when we try to follow this way that Jesus lined out. Uh, pardon the uh. So Mark's outline, and I think it's important to know his outline, because we've all, we have traditionally in the past just read scripture as if everything is equal, and you just pick out a verse here and a verse out of another gospel and so forth. But Mark has a very definite arrangement. I told you. 
baptism and call to ministry, his vision, going into the wilderness, and so forth, the past, to come back with a vision, a dream of God. And then secondly, uh, those chapters before chapter 11, uh, 2 through 10, I guess, uh, they all describe situations where Jesus is encountering people or he's teaching or he is actively healing people. And he's talking to his disciples and he's talking beyond his disciples at times to other people in the crowd. And then this chapter 11 comes and then we're into uh, Holy Week, as we call it. But going into Holy Week has a prelude, and it's such an interesting prelude. First of all, there's a, a young man, in, they're in Jericho. Jericho is about the oldest, one of the oldest cities in the world. And the, the young man comes to Jesus, and he says, what must I do to have to attain eternal life. Jesus says, well, you know the commandments, don't you? Do not kill, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not bear false witness, do not lie, so on and so forth. And the man interestingly says, you know, I've kept all of these, all of those commandments from my youth. And Jesus looked at the young man, and he loved him. He loved him for his good intention. And then Jesus said something very sobering. He said, okay, now if you just go and sell everything you have, and then come and follow me, that's the path we're on. That's what will truly help you attain eternal life. And according to Mark, the young man went away grieving, not ashamed, not hurt, not feeling embarrassed, but grieving because he had many, many possessions. Jesus challenged, attacked the very center of this young man's life because, to be honest, he had grown up worshiping the things he had and didn't even know it. Does that sound a little familiar? Yeah, I think it does. It does for me and it may for you. In the story of this young man, it's kind of a prelude to what's coming next. And that is the final healing of a blind man. And it says this time, the blind man who is healed jumps up and says, I see, and follows Jesus, runs after him. Because they've started down the path from Jericho to Jerusalem. Now contrast that with the rich young man. And that's what, that's what Mark wants us to do. He, he wants us to see how difficult it is for anybody with riches to enter the kingdom of God. And yet here's this beggar sitting on, his name is even Bartimaeus. Uh, you may know him. He's sitting on the side of the road and he says, who is this? What is all this turmoil going on in front of me? Tell me somebody. And he says, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, Jesus, heal me. And, and, and Jesus does. And then he followed him. But this reminds us of how Jesus attacks the rich. He says, to his disciples, it's really, really hard 
for anyone rich to get into heaven. He said it's like a camel going through the eye of a needle, like two humps, bloom, bloom. <laughs> Maybe they laughed, but he was talking about the virtual impossibility of the rich going to heaven. I don't think we knew that. I, I mean, we, we've been told there's a lot of other themes in Mark, and of course there is. But I think over and over again, Jesus challenges the rich. And moreover, there are some who think, because it's documented in one place, that the first Christians in Jerusalem after Jesus' resurrection called themselves the poor. The poor. In other words, standing to stand or sit or kneel in concert, in solidarity with the poor. James, who is Jesus' brother, who is the head of the council in Jerusalem, according to Acts, he's, he is said to have had uh, warts on his knees from kneeling so much, praying so much, and his whole life was spent helping the poor. The book of James has, the letter of James, later in the New Testament, has been maligned. Luther maligned it. He, he wanted to throw it out of the, of the uh, canon of the New Testament. Can you believe that? Uh, he wanted to throw it out because it didn't stress enough his faith in faith, his belief that you have to believe uh, to be saved. It was all about works, or it was finally about works in that book, in that small letter. And Luther just was so single-minded that he really couldn't take it. Let me read you a, ch a little bit from the book of James. Come now, you rich people, this is in the book of James. Weep and wail for the miseries that are coming on you. Your riches have rotted, and your clothes are mothy, and your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidence against you, and it will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure for the last days. Listen, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, dry out, and the cries of the field workers have been heard by the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your heart in the day of slaughter. That's really a put down. That is a scathing indictment. Let's see, somebody recently won, two people won the lottery, right? A combined value of a billion dollars. Do you know how many suckers contributed to that billion dollars? 54 million. 54 million tickets were sold, hoping and praying that their one or two dollars was going to somehow pay off. You didn't do that, did you? I, I, we, we, we tell ourselves, well, if I really won the lottery, I would give half of it to the poor. Uh -huh. Yeah. More likely, you're going to give half of it to the IRS. You know how stupid that is? Investing in something like that? It's like pushing a car through the eye of a needle to put it into modern terminology. Jesus starts down the path, actually starts out ahead of the disciples who are amazed and afraid, some of them. Because Jesus he has told them he's going to Jerusalem and he may die. 
It's an interesting thing, isn't it? Embracing one's fate. I mean, martyrs in the past history of the world, there have been a few that have actually embraced their death, their fate. You remember Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, the night before he was assassinated, he gave a speech nearby, and he said, I may not get there with you, but I've seen the promised land. And then he goes on and on. And we know for sure that he's having some kind of premonition of the next day. But I, if you were told, or I was told, to, um, to, to put our faith on the line and be willing to die for it, or to die for this Jesus of Nazareth, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know because uh, life itself is more important to us than standing up for something, I think. Like many martyrs since that time of Jesus, we, are, we kind of stand astounded by their dedication to a cause, even if it meant death. This is Martin Luther King striding ahead of his father. And where are they going? Oh, that's very, very interesting. They're going to Jerusalem. Now, you just have to know that Jerusalem is, the, is really the center of Mark's whole gospel. I mean, it comes up over and over again. And this time, it's going to be a very powerful and poignant symbol. Um, there are psalms which people are supposed to sing as they are going up to Jerusalem for a festival. What I mean is there are caravans of people who came for Passover from Jericho or Galilee or that area, Judea, and in caravans they were protected against something that might happen. And th there are Psalms, 121, 34, 120 through 134, there are psalms of ascent, they're called, because you have to go up to get to Jerusalem from Jericho. And one of them tells you how much they love Jericho. This is a Psalm 37, 137, of the exiles in Babylon 500 years before if I do not remember thee, Jerusalem. Let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, if I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. They are longing for home, longing against all odds that they might return going home. And then Mark helps us to understand the rest of his gospel. He divides it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the days of a week. And I have here um, quoted a passage right before each day when they were approaching Jerusalem, 11.1. 1. On the following day, 11.12, in the morning, 11.20, it was two days before Passover, that's in chapter 14. On this first day of unleavened bread is 14 to 12. As soon as it was morning, the Sabbath, very early on the first day of the week. I really appreciate Mark trying to be so deliberate when we have really mashed all of the New Testament together. Even John gets mashed in there with the Synoptic Gospels. 
But Mark is clearly about keeping people on track, on path, as Jesus and his followers go to Jerusalem. This is the way it might have looked before there was a highway where you drove cars to Jerusalem. These are a couple of Latter-day pilgrims going to Jerusalem. And uh, here's the map, as you can see. It isn't very complicated. It's 18 miles from Jericho to Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, the city, here is another, another shot of the pathway that might have been the one they went up that time. And here are the Psalms of Ascent. You ought to really look them over. Is it fascinating? You know, and, and, and maybe you can hear the pilgrims singing them because they knew them by heart, evidently. And uh, they're all about Jerusalem, our love, our home, the place where it's all going to happen. Uh, Jesus rides in to Jerusalem by, by what's called the Golden Gate. That's on the east side facing Jericho. On the west side, there are troops, uh, Roman troops, coming from Caesarea Maritime, which is one of the cities, by the way, that Herod uh, built uh, for a coastal getaway, a beach for the Romans in one way or another. And uh, they would, they, there would be troops that would accompany the procurator, the, the, the head of the government who was Pontius Pilate, uh, as he went to Jerusalem. They didn't want to be in Jerusalem. He didn't want to be in Jerusalem all the time, even though there was a palace there. I mean, you know, putting up with all these whining Jews and, uh, and others and little conflicts. He'd rather be on the coast in a rich uh, palace-like uh, abode. But as they were striding in, you could probably hear the drums, uh, the drums from these troops on the other side of town, where Jesus came in. Now let me put some facts out there for you. Of course, David, it's called the city of David, Jerusalem, and David in, in, his, in Jewish folklore was loved more than he deserved because he was the greatest king, according to later ages. He was the most handsome guy. He was musical. He was a leader, leader. He was a warrior. And the Jews in Jesus' day and before were hoping for another David, a greater than David, a beyond David, who would come and set them free from the, the most recent control military of the Roman army. And in Jerusalem, um, Herod had done something absolutely stunning. Now this is the way, except for the Golden Dome, this is a little bit the way Jesus and the caravan would have seen Jerusalem coming over the crest of a hill from, say, Bethany or Bethpage. Uh, it was a glittering city. It, uh, it was a symbol of God's presence. So you know why? Because of the temple. Although the God of, of Israel was more or less seen as a tenting God, as a tabernacling God. 
but he was known to, to stop every now and then in Jerusalem. And it was the place you could go to really find your way in life and after life. Now, here is, this is, this is, there's the temple over in the far right. Over in the far right, that's a, this is a mock-up of the huge platform that Herod built. It's four football fields long, and he had it built during his reign, and you can see the wall there in the front left, and that's where one of the wailing walls, so-called, is for Jews. And, uh, but there is his palace. I mean, it was stunning. Uh, here's the temple, or the temple complex, along with barracks on either side, and a court, and of course, the Roman emperor's palace. And just one more. Here's the way the palace looked. It was, it was stunning. Gold and silver all over the place. Even chairs that were gold or silver. And you can see how huge it was with its own courtyard and fountain and all the rest. Uh, I don't know why. Why our friend Pontius Pilate wouldn't want to stay there. I certainly would. And here's another. Here's another reconstruction of a wall that <clears throat> is gold plated, so to speak. And just to keep you up to date with some of the facts, here's the golden gates. This was the gates they once were open. They are uh, sealed up now, but it was once the gates where this greater than David, this king, was going to come eventually. It's going to come right through that, and that's the gates where Jesus himself and other people coming from Galilee, from Judea, the city swole, was, would swell from 40,000 normally to 200,000. So there were a lot of people streaming into the city and going directly to the temple, a lot of them. And there were stairs almost immediately after you'd gone through the walls and uh, leading up to that platform, leading up on top of that platform where the temple was. And there were various rules about who could go up there and who couldn't. Um, as I said, the final, the final seven chapters of Mark is about Jesus' experience in Jerusalem. In my Bible, <coughs> it says, <coughs> excuse me, it says, Jesus' triumphal entry. I don't know about that. Um, <coughs> I don't know whether to call it triumphal. We have always been taught that all the people in the streets were waving palms and shouting Hosanna in the highest. Uh, Hosanna to him who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As if it was all pointed toward Jesus. I don't think it was. I rather think that that was a common shout and the waving of palms was a common act when it came to everybody coming into Jerusalem. Now, I don't mean Jesus didn't have his followers. Sure, I think he, 
he had a, a group of people who had been on the caravan with him and entered those gates with him. But I, I think we have to put it into context. And we have to realize that probably an awful lot of other people were coming through. And some who might have been <clears throat> coming through claiming to be king. Or let me, let me put it another way. Let me put it in terms of one of the travelers. A man speaks. We heard him in Jerusalem. And my friend, and, uh, we heard him in Jericho. And my friend and I decided, no needed, to find out more about this Jesus of Nazareth. So we joined their caravan going up, for, uh, up from Jericho to the festival of Passover in Jerusalem. Uh, it, we've been there before, but it, was, it is a glittering city. It is a wonder. It's one of the most beautiful cities in the world at this time, thanks to Herod the Great, who some call Herod the Monstrous. So as we walked, <coughs> we sang. It was a tradition, singing pilgrim psalms, psalms of ascent, as we gradually made our way up to Bethany and then to Jerusalem. We stopped for the night, after that, in the little village of Bethany, about a mile from Jerusalem, where we were welcomed beautifully and hospitably by uh, some people who Jesus had known for years. As a matter of fact, these people helped Jesus to prearrange <clears throat> his own entry into Jerusalem. What do I mean? Well, evidently, Jesus pre-planned a kind of a protest, a kind of a demonstration. And he would come in riding on a colt, the foal of an ass, the foal of a donkey, because that's what Zechariah wrote about 9-9, Zechariah 9-9, that the king would be coming on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so Jesus was intentionally, with the help of his friends, going to use that ancient prophecy to fit his entry as a way of proclaiming, silently, of course, what he was all about, what the kingdom of heaven was all about. But as we entered Jerusalem with him, my friend and I were struck by his appearance. He was a simply robed person, riding a donkey through crowds which cheered and shouted, but Jesus sat still, erect, part of the parade, not part of the yelling and the excitement. Everyone knew about the other military procession coming in with their spears and their shields and their weapons. You could almost hear the sound of the drums. So there we were, my friend and I, following at a distance, following the man of Nazareth, wondering about our destination <clears throat> and the what then of this entry, of this journey. What was the blurry goal we were going toward? We watched him, but we were not in the festival mood. Something was amiss. Something about it. Something about to happen, and we were having second thoughts about our involvement. For we both got a whiff of the possible plots against this Jesus by the, by the collaboration of Herod Antipas and the high priesthood, and of course, the Roman military keeping a wary eye on everything, on these zealots, some of them, that had come to disrupt the Roman uh, control of Jerusalem. And the more he and I, the man and I, my friend and I, talked about this, the, the further back 
we moved so that we were not really anymore in the parade scene. It was simply safer to keep your distance, to be observers. Like when you can sense some kind of some kind of danger coming, and what you want to do is just watch it, but not go toward it, not be part of it, not have it land on your head. So we had been following Jesus, but now we were observers because we knew something was going to happen in the next days at Passover in Jerusalem. And I wonder, I wonder about you and me. Are we followers or observers? As we take in all this information, are we followers? Or are we like those two young men, observers? You have to answer that yourself. I have. Thanks. Let me go up to a really nice Pathways painting by Janine. One of our good artists in the congregation. And this was presented to me after Pathway. But I think it's a final reminder of the way, the way of acting like Jesus, not just watching.